Well, good morning. Uh, sorry about the confusion we had with the first session this morning. I uh, completely messed up the times and the, 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 the topic, so we will uh, we will revisit Flowex Express Advanced in another session. But uh, today, let me see what we're doing. Actually, I've got a PowerPoint presentation. We are doing Flowex Proving Configuration. All right, so that's it for the PowerPoint presentation. We're gonna go ahead and move on to, uh, to actually what's, what's going on inside the Flowex. My name is Brent Palmer, I'm with CRT Services. Just wanna welcome you to this online training that we're doing. And today's topic is Flowex Prover Configuration. We have other topics that are posted up to our YouTube channel at uh, CRT Services. So please feel free to browse those and uh, submit some feedback on them. If you'd like to see some other uh, topics or specific troubleshooting techniques or something else, please let us know. We'll make a video up on it or have a live event like this and record it and put it up so you have a future reference to it. So we're going to, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with this. And uh, we've got some more people that are joining in, so I'll be letting those people into the, uh, the room as we, as we go through the meeting. But uh, we'll go ahead and we're going to get right into the FlowX. So with the FlowX, I'm going to go into a web browser because I have an application, the U.S. Liquids application, that is loaded up to my uh, FlowX. And in order to configure this, I need to log in. And when I log in, I'm presented with a whole host of other information. So the first thing I want to do is, if I don't see the proving icon, I want to make sure that I set up the FlowX to have proving enabled. And to set up the FlowX to enable proving, I just need to go into configuration, into the overall setup, and go into common settings. And the flow computer type I need to set up is either a proving run, a station proving run, or a station and approving or a prover IO server. We're gonna keep it simplistic just for today. The basically I'm saying that on this module, I have both a prover and a run. So when I select proving and run, I would apply that, and then that will give me the ability to have the, uh, the proving operation icon right here. Now we're gonna go in and we're actually gonna configure up the prover, and there's a couple different things that we need to set up when we're configuring the prover. First is we need to set up our IO, and then we need to set up the characteristics of the prover. So really doesn't matter which one you set up first, but I typically like to go in and set up my, my inputs and outputs first for the prover. So depending on the type of prover, we may have different inputs and outputs uh, to, to uh, operate the prover and also with our detector switches coming back in. So we're gonna go into IO and I'm gonna go into module one because I only have one module in this system. And I'm gonna go into configuration and then I can either go into digital IO assign or digital IO settings. Digital IO assign shows the tag, the, what we're gonna call that digital input, and then the signal type that's gonna be used. As where if I hit the back arrow and go into digital IO settings, it allows a little bit more advanced settings. So it still has the tag, the signal type, but then it also allows you to select the polarity and some other things inside here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I have to have a meter pulse coming in. So I'm just gonna tag digital input no, number one and assign it as the meter pulse. And then I'll come over to the signal type and I'll tell it that it's going to be pulse input 1A. And what this means is for a, uh, for a meter, I can have two pulses coming in. This is the A stream pulse coming in off the meter. I may have a turbine meter or another type of meter where I have two pulse streams coming in, but in this case, I just have one. There's really nothing else I have to change on here. The voltage threshold of 1.25 volts should be good. So I'll go ahead and apply those. The next thing I need to do is I need to assign a prover detector input. So the FlowX allows for the ability to have four different types of detectors or four different prover volumes. So I can assign up to four prover detectors coming in. In this case, we're just gonna keep it as a single detector. So whether it's a ball prover or a small volume prover, may have two detectors on it, one to start and another one to stop, but they're common to each other, meaning that the signal coming in from the prover 
is just one signal. When I see it the first time, I assume it's the first detector. And when I see that signal again, I assume it's the second detector. This is probably the most common setup for provers, both ball and compact, where the detectors are combined as just one signal coming back from the flow computer. Obviously, if you can separate these, it helps to diagnose when you're having problems with issues of whether I've hit the first detector or second detector, because now we're just seeing a digital come in and we assume it's one and then the other. But I'm just gonna leave this as a simplistic uh, detector input. So I'm gonna say uh, prover detector. And again, the tags are just for my reference. It doesn't assign it as the prover detector until I come over here and say that it is the prover A common start stop. So both prover A common and start. It's one common detector for both. Now, if I was doing uh, two detectors, I would have to come down and set up another digital input, and then I would say it's the prover A uh, stop. So my first stop and my second stop, because basically the way the prover volumes go is I have a prover volume from A to C, I have a prover volume from A to D, I have a prover volume from B to C, and a prover volume from B to D. That gives me my four prover volumes. But typically, we're just doing an AC, and if I say that it's common, that means that I'm just using one detector, so I don't need to set up the second detector. You'll also see that you have an option for prover B. So the FlowX allows you to configure two provers in, at two different prover types with inside of a single flow computer. So I can have a compact prover as prover A and a ball prover as prover B or a master meter as prover A, any combination that you, you need to have. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply those changes. Now when I apply the changes, they're being written right to the flow computer. So I'm online live with a module right now. The last thing I have to do is I'm, set, I'm gonna set this up as a compact prover. I have to set up a launch command. So I have to tell the prover when to initiate the prove sequence, when to either launch the ball by moving a four-way valve, or when to launch the piston and pull the piston back upstream. So we're gonna keep this as a compact or a piston prover. So I just need to have a, uh, an output for prover launch. Now it's a generic output, it's just a digital output. So over on the digital type, I'm going to go and say that this is just a digital output. The polarity is normal, so meaning that it's low and will go high to launch the prover. And I'm gonna maintain it for at least a thousand milliseconds or one second. So that way I can ensure that the prover actually sees this signal. I'll go ahead and apply those. So using these three digitals, you basically have assigned two of them as inputs, one for the meter pulse input, the other one for the detector input, and then one as an output for my prover launch command. So we'll go ahead and uh, get into now the, uh, the rest of the, the configuration for the prover. So I can navigate on the left-hand side, or I'll just go back home and go into configuration, and you see I have proving. And the first thing I need to do is start setting up my prover setup. So in my prover setup, my two different provers, I can select what type of provers they are. Now we said we wanted to use a uh, compact prover. So a Calibron, FlowMD, or Meter Engineers, uh, the setup for them is pretty similar. So we'll just go and say a Calibron FlowMD. And when I apply those changes, you'll see a blink of the screen. And what that's doing is that's now allowing me for, uh, allowing more displays to be uh, shown within the FlowX so we can go in and do our configuration. So now when I go back up one screen, you'll see that I have more screens for configuration. And we're just simply gonna go into Prover A, and we'll go into our Prover setup. And it's asking me if the Prover is local or if it's remote, meaning that I can have a Prover connected to one module and share it with 50 or 60 other FlowX modules. And it wants to know, is the Prover connected locally to the uh, module or is it on a remote device? We're gonna keep it as local. The next is, do I have uh, pressure and temperature coming into it? We didn't set up our pressure temperature transmitters coming in, but we'll leave those both as analog. So I have a prover inlet temperature. You have the ability to have a prover outlet temperature. So if I have a temperature transmitter on the pipe coming into the prover, a temperature transmitter on the outlet, and then the rod temperature. So the flags for a compact prover reside on a uh, rod, and that rod 
can have a temperature transmitter on it because there's expansion and contraction of the metal of that rod. And we can take that into, a, into account when we determine the volume of the prover during a, a normal proving. So right now I'm gonna say that there is no rod temperature, or I could just say it's an analog input and I would assign an analog to it. We have our prover pressure. So I can assign those to analog inputs or I can go to a remote server or I can have them in this heart or Modbus. So inlet pressure or inlet pressure, outlet pressure. And then if I have a plenum pressure, plenum pressure is there's a pressure for the poppet on the piston on Brooks Brewers. You can assign a transmitter for that also. If I have a separate densitometer for the prover, I can set up a densitometer for the prover. If I don't assign a prover density, then I'm gonna assume that the density of the prover is the same as the density of the meter, and we'll use the meter's density as the prover calculation. And then for the valve control, if I'm using a ball prover or another prover, and I need to control the four-way valve, do I have a four-way valve control signals for inputs and outputs? In this case, we don't, it's a compact prover. We're just gonna have a launch output, and we'll be able to configure that on another screen. So I'm gonna come back up, and now we'll go into the Calibron Flow MD. So here's prover identification. These are merely informational tags where I can put in the prover name, ID, what type of material it is. I spoke in another lesson uh, about what these little pop-ups are. And what they are is little helps that can tell you about what that tag or what that configuration parameter is. So we need to know what the internal diameter of the prover is, what the wall thickness, and then we have some uh, square coefficient expansions that we put in based upon the material. And you can see that depending on the material of the, uh, the prover itself, we need to uh, do a calculation that uh, applies a correction for the effects of temperature and pressure on the steel. So depending on the type of steel, we have some uh, correction factors that we put in there. Now, typically when you get a prover, you'll have a water draw certificate. And the square expansion coefficients and the linear, linear expansion co coefficients and the modules of elasticity will also be on the approval water draw certificate. So you can get those numbers from there. Um, and they come from the company that's come out and done the water draw or the manufacturer of the, uh, the prover itself. The last two we have are what are the base temperatures, the reference temperature and pressure that the prover was uh, water drawed at. So a water draw is a calibration of the measured section of the prover. They basically are moving the piston to the first detector. And then once it gets there, as it starts displacing water, they're precisely either measuring the water using seraphim cans that are certified at NIST, or they're using it gravimetrically and they're using a certified scale to weigh the water and determine the volume by the mass of the water that went through from first switch to the second switch. And that gives me my prover volume. So what, what conditions was that done at? That is the reference temperature that they were taken back to. The detector configuration is the uh, detector switch is coming back in and you can see that we, right now it's defaulted to one common input. So we said that we were only gonna have one digital input. Now if I had multiple inputs, a start and a stop, or three inputs, one start and two stops, then I could go in and set things up of what type of configuration I have. But right now we're just using one common. The next setting is the single uh, delay, detector delay. On a piston prover, or on a piston prover, we don't need to set this. We'll default this to zero. What that delay is for is on a mechanical prover, we may have the ball coming through at a high velocity and it hits a mechanical detector switch. That det that uh, detector switch can bounce up and down uh, as the, as the ball goes by, and it creates a slap or a bounce. And this takes that bounce into consideration and says basically, if I put a delay in there. I'll ignore any bounce that I see at the, uh, the, after the ball has gone by. So when I see the first uh, square wave come in and I go through my voltage threshold, I may see some bouncing coming across from that uh, mechanical switch. I'm going to ignore that bounce and not count it as anything in the flow computer because I could, if I'm just looking for a go high and a go high for starting my proving and stopping my proving, if I don't put that delay in there, I will start and then stop immediately because I've seen another spike in voltage on the detector. So this just adds a delay in there. Piston provers are uh, optical. So an optical switch is not gonna have that slap coming in. So there's no need for the delay. 
off of our water draw certificate, we're gonna get our prover volume. In this case, uh, we were looking at uh, the A to C volume. So we're using a common detector switch and we're gonna use A to C volumes, but obviously you can put up to four. When I talked about the, your, your volumes can be A to C, A to D, B to C and B to D, you can put up to four different volumes for that same prover in here if you're using up to four switches. The selected prover volume we're gonna use is A to C. So we know that when we're doing a meter calibration, we're gonna go ahead and use this volume up here on prover A to C. The next settings we have are our prover timing. So we have a sequence that we go through and uh, we have timers in there to make sure that we are seeing our information within the amount of time that we wanna see it in. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through the steps of how this actually works. So the first thing that we do is we issue a launch from the flow computer to the prover. Now, when we do the launch, this digital output that we send, the first thing we do is we have an initial timer that's called the pre-travel delay time. What that does is it allows for any drop in voltage that we may have when we issue the launch. On some older provers, we would actually see a drop in voltage when we issued a launch command. And what would happen was we would detect that as a detector. So what we've said is, the pre-travel delay time, if you set that to something, a second or two seconds, after we issue that launch command, we're gonna wait this amount of time before we even look for a detector switch. So it allows us to have a drop in voltage without counting as a detector. The downside to this is, is if you set this too long, five, six, 10 seconds, you can miss the first switch when the piston starts coming downstream. So I have seen cases where a customer has set up this pre-travel delay time too long. And what happens is the, the piston or the ball has already hit the first switch before this timer times out. And then we start looking. Well, then it hits the second switch and we start proving, but we never see another switch because we've already passed the second switch. So this time usually is good about one or two seconds and then you don't really need to set it any higher than that. You shouldn't see any voltage drop. The travel timeout mode allows you to select either time or volume when we go through the setup inside the rest of these settings. So I can either do uh, maximum pre-travel or over-travel times or volume. So we're gonna stay on time. And the maximum pre-travel time is, I've issued the launch, I've gone for my pre-travel delay time. This is the amount of seconds I'm gonna sit there and wait for the piston to draw all the way back or for the four-way valve to turn and for the ball to start coming forward and see the detector switch. If I don't see it within this time, I'm gonna abort on prover activity. So I'm gonna issue the launch. I'll start my pre-travel delay time. Let's say that we leave that at a second. And then after a second, I'm gonna start looking for that first switch. If I don't see the first switch within this maximum pre-travel time, Right now, set at eight seconds. Maybe I set that to 10 seconds. If I don't see it within 10 seconds, then I'm gonna go ahead and board on prover and activity. I think I've missed the switch or I didn't draw the piston back. That way I'm not sitting there forever while this thing's waiting to see a first switch. I basically said, if I don't see it in this amount of time, I got an issue, I need to go take a look. I'm gonna abort the proving and try to troubleshoot, figure out what's going on. You do need to take into consideration though that if you're using a prover with different flow rates, uh, let's say a, a large size meter and a small size meter on the same prover, that the difference in velocity going through the prover will affect this time. So there may be times where I'm proving a, a very small meter at a lower flow rate and 10 seconds is not enough for that piston to start traveling downstream after it's pulled up, or 10 seconds is not enough for the four-way valve to lift up turn and for that ball to hit the first detector. So just be aware that your flow rate velocity affects your maximum pre-travel time of, of how much travel time you want to set in there. The next setting is, I'm going to skip over volume because we can set that to barrels. So we can say that the maximum travel time is, or the maximum pre-travel is by barrels and we'll only allow 50 barrels to go through before we time out. But in this case, we're going to stay with time. So the maximum prove time is 60 seconds. So I issue the launch. I have a pre-travel delay time of one second. I'm gonna wait up to 10 seconds to see my first detector switch. After I see my first detector switch, 
I'm gonna wait up to 60 seconds to see my second detector switch. So again, the flow rate of which you're going through the prover is greatly gonna affect how long you wanna wait between first switch and second switch. Maybe a lot longer, maybe a lot less, but you can pretty much fine tune these and get within a comfortable window of not waiting forever for the thing to time out if it doesn't see the second switch, but giving it enough time to hit the switch on both low velocities and high velocities. The last thing we do after we hit the switch is we go and we're gonna do another run. So we wanna wait and we're gonna do an over travel volume or an over travel time. So the over travel time basically says, once I hit the second switch, I'm gonna wait this amount of time before I issue a launch again. You may have that for the ball to get fully downstream because if we cycle the four-way valve too soon, if I did it as soon as I hit the switch, the four-way valve would rise up, turn around, set down, and that I may not have full flow going through the prover. I may still be bypassing through the four-way valve as I'm switching flow direction and the ball could hit the switch and our timing would be off. Or the piston hasn't gone all the way home yet and it hasn't gone to a seated position. I have to wait for it to get to a, uh, its downstream position before I issue a prover launch to drag that piston back again. We have two different methods for meter factor calculation. We can use the average data method. The average data method is looking at the counts and for repeatability, we're trying to uh, look at counts for each run, how many meter pulses I got in and looking at the difference between those for the, uh, the calculation method, or I can use uh, an average meter factor where I'm looking at the meter factor between each run and calculating out a meter factor and determining the meter factor from the average of the, uh, the meter factors that I've calculated for each run. We also have the ability to do alternative calculations. So what that means is if I have a volume meter, and I'm using the pulses as volume, I'm going to prove the meter by volume. So I will do a volume calculation of, of the liquid at the meter, and I'll do a volume calculation of the liquid in the prover. I'll apply my effects of temperature and pressure to both the liquid at the meter and the liquid at the prover. And then I will determine what those two volumes are to derive my, my meter factor. If I do it alternatively, I can take a volume uh, meter and then calculate it as mass. And then I can calculate the mass of the prover and I do a mass to mass calculation instead of doing a volume to volume. Or if I have a mass meter, I can do a mass meter volumetrically, provided I have density. I have to know obviously the, the density if I'm doing a volume cor uh, correction from or a volume calculation from mass. So typically we may have meters out there that we're either doing a mass to mass or we're doing a volume to volume, but you may have times where you're doing a volume to mass and mass to volume. So the last thing we have is our prover start command, and we had set that up as a digital output. So I need something to command that prover. So if I have multiple modules, I can set it to a particular module down here on the digital output. In this case, we are on the local module, which is module one. And we said that we're gonna have the uh, launch command, I believe was on digital three. So when I change this to digital three, down here it's gonna tell me, yep, that tag I put in there, I did set that up as prover launch. So it goes over and, and just verifies that. Operationally, we have the ability to set our number of runs, our passes per run, the required of sex successful runs. With the FlowX, you can do up to 30 runs you can do up to 20 passes per run. And the required successful runs, you can do up to uh, 30 if that's, if that's what you wanna go up to. Double chronometry, we talked about this improving, whether you want that to be enabled or disabled. The required successful runs are how many runs need to be in, uh, in, in consecutive runs that fall into a repeatability, whether it's by a fixed repeatability or whether it's by an uncertainty. So this is the number of runs I need to see. The repeatability right now is based on the pulse counts. I have a fixed repeatability limit, meaning when it's fixed, I'm gonna look at 0.05%. I wanna see four runs, and those four runs need to be consecutive and be within 0.05% of each other. The maximum I'll allow the prover to run is 10 runs. If I can't get four consecutive runs within 0.05%, I'll abort the proving on repeatability. 
if I go to progressive uncertainty, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I need to see four runs, but my uncertainty needs to be 0.027%. So if I set this to 30, I'll allow the system to continue running until it meets a progressive uncertainty of 0.027%, which when I look at uh, API's calculations, that, that uncertainty may be 12 runs at 1% repeatability. What I'm more concerned about is what is the uncertainty and a 0.027 uncertainty allows me to have more successful, more runs within a certain repeatability limit that maybe is higher. And the flow computer will keep on running until it determines that it cannot reach that progressive uncertainty. Once it gets there, it'll come up and say repeatability out of limits and it will, it will basically abort. Do I want to auto implement the new meter factor? So if the meter factor falls within some certain criteria, do I want to implement it? How long will I wait to implement it? Do I want to use a custom proving permissive? I may have a uh, digital that comes in that says that I have proving permissive to go ahead and prove now, and that will initiate the proving. If not, um, I may not have a custom permissive. Do I want to use prover integrity custom permissive? What that is is uh, prover integrity may be that I'm looking at valves. The valves have to be seated. On a four-way valve, it may be a differential pressure switch in there that basically says I'm sealed and I'm good. And do I want to see a preliminary proving report? So what happens is the proving reports typically have whether the meter factor was implemented or not. So a lot of people need to see the proving report to determine if they want to implement the meter factor. And then they want another report that says, yes, the meter factor was implemented. They have a physical report now that says the meter factor was implemented. So when you enable this, it gives you a pre-report saying, hey, here's the information. And then it gives you the option to accept that meter factor. And then the meter factor is applied as the new meter factor. And then the report uh, indicates that the meter factor was applied. So that's all that's doing for you. Stability checks, you have the ability to do an initial stability check. So when I issue the launch command or I issue a prove request, if this is enabled, it's going to look for stabilization. And what it's looking for is this criteria. It's saying, I'm going to let for a maximum of 30 seconds, I'm going to let you take a look. I need to see five seconds consecutive where the temperature hasn't changed more than three degrees, where the pressure hasn't changed more than 50 PSI, where the flow rate hasn't changed more than 5%, and the maximum deviation of temperature between the prover and the meter can't be more than 10 degrees, and the maximum pressure deviation between the prover and the meter can't be more than 50 pounds. Now, obviously, th these are very extreme. Typically, you don't wanna see uh, a deviation of more than a degree or even a half degree between your meter and prover. You shouldn't see much pressure. You definitely don't wanna see a flow rate change during during this time because you would like to have a nice stable flow. So if I enable that, we'll look at this. If I disable it, as soon as I hit the prove request, it will go ahead and launch. If you, uh, if you enable this, when I hit prove request, it'll say uh, stabilizing. And once it sees that five consecutive seconds, it will go ahead and issue the launch command. If it doesn't see the five, it'll abort and say uh, unstable. The other thing we can do is during the course of the proof, if we enable the proof sequence stabilization check, if we enable this during the course of the proof, we'll still look at this criteria. Typically, we would ignore the criteria of, let's say, temperature and pressure changes during the course. But if you enable this, we're basically saying all during the proving, I can't see these things go off. I can't have high deviations. I can't have great flow rate changes and so forth. So if they're enabled, we'll continue to do those checks. Meter factor tests, when they're enabled, this is for auto implementing our meter factors. So we have tests that you can look at where one, we won't have a meter factor that's generated. We won't accept one that's higher than 1.01 or 0 0.9900. If I disable that, I don't care what meter factor is generated. As long as it falls into some other criteria, it will be automatically implemented. In this case, I'll leave this enabled. These are adjustable, so you can change your high and low limits. Previous meter factor looks at the last time the meter was proved, what was its factor, and is this factor deviated more than 0.25%. I can also look back at the last 10 meter factors that have been derived for that meter, 
And if, I've, if I'm out within more than 0.25% of the average of the last 10, I won't automatically implement the meter factor. And then I can also have a baseline curve. Uh, the, you're allowed to put a 12 point curve in for the meter factors. If we deviate more than 0.25% from the base curve that was derived, it will not implement. So control for, chart meter factor test specifies whether the proved meter factor is checked against an API 13.2 control chart, and then how close does it need to be? So you can apply these or you can disable these tests and it will automatically implement or not implement, but these tests will always run. So you can always see the results of them, whether they're enabled or disabled. It just affects whether the meter factor will be automatically implemented. The last thing we have is your temperature and pressure setup. So we would go in here, we would select what analog we want to use, what analog input we're going to use, and then our tag would be here. So real quickly, I'll jump into the analogs and set one of them up because um, we're almost out of time. So I'll go into configuration on the analogs. We'll set number one as prover temperature. And we'll say that it's zero to 100 degrees. So I'll go back home, go into configuration, proving, prover A, go into prover temperature. And now you can see when it's set to one, it's using analog input one for prover temperature. And right now it's failed to the last good value because I obviously don't have an analog input coming in. When we're all set and ready to prove, I click on proving, go to proving operation, and I can start my, my uh, proof sequence. I can accept the factor, reject the factor, Abort the proving, I can see what my current proof runs, passes, stability, my permissive, my deviations, my integrity, what prover I want to use, whether I'm using prover A or prover B, and it's giving me my prover status. Right now there's I don't know flow. If you're ever wanting to test the functions of proving in a lab or so forth, you have to, you can't go in and force pulses. You actually have to have physical pulses coming into the flow X. So if I have a pulse generator, I can put that in and then I have to have a physical detector switch or a physical switch to start and stop the proving. You have to have those wired in and then you'll be able to simulate proving inside the flow computer. And that's the basic proving setup. Um, are there any questions? Perfect. Well, we are going to continue the series next week. Uh, this is all we have, I believe, for, let me check real quick. Uh, yep, this is all we have for this week. So next week, we'll start into some more topics. We're going to be adding a few more in for density calculations and a few other things. So if you have any questions, please get a hold of us at uh, CRT Services. Um, if there's any questions we can't answer, we will make sure that we get you with an industry expert who can answer those questions. If you have some topics that you want to go over, please shoot us an email with those topics. And uh, everybody, I hope you have a safe and uh, uh, just a real good weekend in this time that we have going on or uncertainty. And uh, just be safe out there. Thank you.